What's up, everybody? It's Matt Johnson. We are back with another episode of Real Estate Uncensored. This is the place where you get actionable ideas, insight, and inspiration to turn your real estate career into a life of freedom. And uh, I am off the chain today. I have no co-host. Greg McDaniel is not with me today. He is uh, about to head out for his big trip to uh, to Japan. And so it's me, and I've got a phenomenal guest here with us today, Kelly O'Neill, and we're talking about how to market millionaires. So we'll bring her in in a second. Guys, if you're watching on Facebook, make sure to let us know kind of where you are at so we can keep you in mind for referrals. Uh, and we're also going to talk about uh, how to kind of upgrade and, and upgrade your client base. So I'd love for you to tell us uh, who your ideal client is right now and who you'd like to work with because we're going to talk about some ways to upgrade the types of clients that you're working with and work with more affluent people. So with that being said, Kelly, officially welcome. Thank you so much. I'm super thrilled to be here today. I know it's going to be a blast. Uh, we had an awesome, really, really fun prep call. You have some uh, some very strong and fun opinions that we're going to talk about. I, um, I, I do. Some, some that we can't talk about publicly, which I would love to get into, but we're also going to talk about um, – uh, everything that applies to real estate agents, that's not the only type of client that you help, but real estate is often in your client base for, for a few reasons. So I'd love for you to share just kind of how do you describe to people what you do, since you're not really a real estate coach per se, but you do help people uh, that are marketing themselves as agents to kind of increase and, and up their marketing game. I do. So what I do is I am a brand marketing strategist and business consultant, and I work with um, people in a variety of different um, industries. I mean, everyone from real estate to a lot of real estate investors to, you know, attorneys to, you know, doctors, coaches, consultants. I work with a gamut of people, but what I really specialize in is helping to position people in the marketplace to make their competition ir irrelevant and attract more affluent clients. So that is really my strong bailiwick. Cool. And what's your, uh, tell me a little bit about the background, how you got to be doing this. Uh, doing, okay. So I, well, so the, there's two stories here, right? There's two little storylines that that go along with this. Number one, I was actually raised affluent. My father was a business owner. He's an entrepreneur himself and did very well for himself. And so I was raised my entire life in a very affluent um, surrounding. Now, before okay. everyone pulls out the world's smallest violin for me, here's what I will tell you. There was no silver spoon being popped in this mug. None. Okay. So my dad was very much about like, look, I worked my, by the way, I swear. So I, is that okay? It's, it's called uncensored for a reason. All right. Yeah. <laughs> my dad was like, I worked my ass off. You were going to do the same thing. You are a guest in my lifestyle. So, okay. you know, he was very much about like, you want money? Get a job. You want a car? Get a job. You know, you're going to, you're going to do it for yourself. But, but the, the good part about that, I mean, the, well, there was lots of good about the whole thing. Um, okay. The good part about that, though, was that I was really immersed in the psychology of affluence, um, constantly being around people who had that affluent mindset. So fast forward, I go to college, right, because um, when I got out on my own and I lived in my first 600 square foot apartment with four people, I was like, well, this sucks. And um, I really preferred my old way of living in mom and dad's, you know, beautiful, you know, McMansion with the housekeeper and the, the gourmet food. And I was like, hey, this top ramen and freezing my ass off thing is not cutting it. <laughs> and so I was like, I better go to college and get my shit together. So I did. And um, when I was in college, I started working at uh, a brand agency and uh, spent the next, you know, several years in and out of agencies and corporations doing branding and, and public relations. And when I finally got that, that little hint of, you know, this is, I don't want to work for other people anymore. Like I could have much more freedom and much more money if I went out on my own. Um, then, you know, and I started my own, my own company, you know, initially I just started teaching them about branding and marketing because I completely understand the importance. Even back then when I started my company in 2001, I understood the importance of being a market disruptor and really making sure that you stand out because if you are not standing out, you are invisible. Okay. Yeah. Like that's a writer. That's a writer downer. If you are not standing out, you're invisible. And I 
I got that when I got into business. Um, and then fast forward to when the market crashed, you, all you real estate agents, I'm sure, are very familiar with this time in about 2008. And I knew, um, because I watch market trends, I knew that I needed to get ahead of the market. And I wanted to, um, and at that point, too, a lot of other people had come into the market, and this is a little bit about what we were talking about before. Um, mm -hmm. There were a lot more coaches in the market kind of clouding the, the you know, message and services of coaches. And I was like, I better, I need to reposition myself. And I was like, what was the one thing that I could do that when I, that when I do this, I could serve so many people and help them. That really is something that only I can do because of who I am. And, you know, it was literally like, you know, I don't know if you guys believe in miracles. I'm not super woo woo. I mean, I'm a little woo, but not super woo woo. And <laughs> I, like you know, I, there. I'm halfway there. Like, I kind of believe, like, you know, stuff crosses your path for a reason and you should pay attention. Right. But I'm not going to sit on my couch and, you know, chant, you know, and try to make money flow in through my chimney. Like, you know, it's, right. there's, a, there's a line there. That sounds like a good balance to me. I like that. It, it's right. It's balanced, yeah. right? Yeah. So um, uh, I read the book. Someone gave me the book from Dan Kennedy, um, The No BS Guide to Marketing to the Affluent. And yeah. – I read this and I was like, well, duh. And then I realized, oh my God, not everybody knows this. And then I started looking online and nobody was teaching it. There were books on it, but there were no programs, not one, teaching people wow. how to market and sell to affluent clients when I launched my, my um, program. So, I, I, so that's how I got into it. I, start, I combined my knowledge of marketing and branding with my deep ingrained psychology and experience at be, you know being raised affluent and then putting myself back into an affluent culture as an adult and I started combining those and teaching service providers how to to really go after that market and dominate it yeah, that's cool. And for anyone that's watching, we've got a bunch of people here with us. Tracy, Anon, Morgan, Katie, um, David. Hi, what is going on, guys? Kurt Francis, what is up, man? Uh, coming off of uh, – man, Kurt was speaking at Harvard here not too long ago. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, thank you, everybody that's watching uh, watching live. Make sure you let us know where you're watching from so we can keep you in mind for referrals and all that good stuff. Um, but uh, for anyone that is familiar with the show and you know uh, Coach Hank – uh, who brought us into our? We moved our team under uh, under him in EXP. He has a program called 36 to Life, and the premise of that is that you really only need, and, and for most agents, would be perfectly happy doing about three deals a month, so 36 total deals a year. But obviously, our businesses still need to grow, and so the way that we grow is by continually increasing the quality of our client and our average sale price. The problem is that, like you talk about, nobody really understands psychologically the differences in moving up in the types of clients that we work with. And so a lot of people maybe set that as an ambition or a goal. I want to okay. work with more affluent clients, but they really don't know where to start and they don't understand if they didn't come from affluence, they don't understand the cycle, the psychology of what it means to be affluent and, and how to market to them. So I kind of like to start there. What are some yep. things that you feel like people get wrong when they go to start marketing to the affluent? Yeah. So the very first thing, and we were talking about this, this a little bit before is, you know, there's some very um, well-known training programs out there that teach you how to go and get new clients. The problem with those programs is that they actually wish the they they cannibalize the number one thing that you need to do to get those affluent clients, which is differentiation. So as okay. an example, if everybody is coming to me, you know, if I go to a networking event and everyone has the same car, kind of card, the same pitch, the same, the same story, the same, you know, it, like if you're, if you're coming at me the same as everyone else, you're leaving me voicemails, you're leaving flyers on my freaking door. Like I'm not going to, as an affluent person, like I'm not, that's not who I'm going for. Right, affluent clientele take a pr primary. Um, their primary um, service providers come from referral. Okay. It's referral or or influencer marketing. Marketing. Right. So they've seen you somewhere speaking on a stage. You you are a pillar of your community. 
you are well known in the community. Affluent people are way more likely to um, do serve to uh, get services or buy into services based on relationships. It's all about relationships. So it's not about buying those flyers and sticking them on doors, guys. It's not about you know passing out passing out cards and cold calling for affluent clients. That's not where you're going to get your clients. Where you're going to get your clients is by building relationships. Oop, I lost you there. You still there? No, I think I either either I lost you or you lost me for a second. I don't um, know. Okay, we're back. Yeah. But uh, so buying, the bank, <laughs> buying based on relationships, uh, which yeah. I totally agree with. I think if there's anything. There we go. I think we're back now. Okay, there you are. Okay, I couldn't okay. see you there for a sec. Yeah, I, I noticed that too. So we'll we'll see if it's uh um my I don't know if it's my internet speed or not, but audience hanging with us, hopefully we'll uh, we'll get that cleared up. But anyway, uh, so I was just saying like there's a big chasm between the way a real estate agent markets themselves and the way a financial advisor does, and I think there's a lot that each side can learn from the other. But I think financial advisors do have it right in the sense that they understand the influencer and the relationship marketing side of things, and for them it's worth it because it's a big get, right? Even if yeah. they only get a portion of somebody's assets under management, there's usually <laughs> millions more that they can eventually get in the relationship. But real estate agents don't think of things that way. We think of things so transactionally that we don't really That's think of, you know, yeah, we don't think of it that way. Whereas a financial advisor thinks in terms of millions of dollars being under, under management and the relationship is the priority. Um, so, so there's that. They also do things like, you know, volunteering and being on the boards of charitable organizations that puts them in contact with a lot of affluent people, which I'm sure you would get into that as a That is tactic, one of my key right? core strategies. It is yeah. get yourself into those situations where you are surrounded by affluent individuals. Yeah. One of my real estate clients in the Bay Area, which by and large is affluent anyways, yep. and where he is, you know, it, where and where he is selling – I I mean, you have to be affluent to live where they live in Silicon Valley. Um, mm -hmm. So there's lots of affluent uh, real estate agents, and this was a key core strategy that we implemented was to get in to the Rotary, to get a board seat there, mm -hmm. to get into, you know, the children's charities, to get into – you know, those, those very, the Lions Club, which in this area is particularly active, the, the, the one certain chamber of commerce, because they're not all created the same, right? But to really? get into those leadership roles in those positions, and also to be sitting on boards of companies with other affluent individuals. How does that work? How do they get on the board of a company? So it's, that's kind of based on who you know. So again, networking. So even in, in the social, the, so one of my suggestions, let me just give, give you guys a golden nugget tip. One of the suggestions that I, I, I suggest, and this is especially true for if you are someone, because I want to address someone who maybe is um, not from an affluent background, maybe this is kind of new to you, I suggest immersing yourself in it. Um, go out to, uh, go out to, nice dinners. Go to the Ritz Carlton for lunch. You know, go test drive a Bentley. They're not going to say no to you, right? Go, go test, go, go to luxury car dealerships, go into luxury department stores, start for free, um, you know, or I mean the cost of lunch or an iced tea, whatever, go start immersing yourself in those environments so that you cut you so that you number one, and watch. I want you to be a fly on the wall, and I really want you to watch what's going on, see how they are treating people, see how the other affluent individuals are acting and behaving. I want you to study. It's almost like a psychological study. Put yourself into the environment and study it. The second thing that I recommend that you do is, and it depends on what you like to do, is um, I would like, I would suggest that you join some sort of club. 
So there's lots of different clubs depending on what people like to do. I myself, as a great example, I am an avid tennis player. The very first thing when I bought my house in Las Vegas and I moved from the Bay Area to Las Vegas, I joined the country club. Boom. Okay. First thing I did. I, I joined the country club. I immersed myself. I started going to the women's lunches, you know, the women's luncheons. Within one time of being there, they invited me to come speak. So then I spoke at the women's luncheon and I was, uh, you know, I played on the tennis team there and I would go just hang out, you know, um, after we would play tennis on like a Friday, you know, afternoon and have a glass of wine with the ladies and you start immersing yourself. And when you're immersing yourself, you're starting to build those relationships. That's when the business conversation comes in. Okay. That's where it comes in. So when you start to make those kinds of connections and you start making those kinds of relationships, those opportunities are presented to you because people want to work with people that they know, like, and trust, and the affluent take that rule to the hilt. They want to work with people that they've met, that they get a good vibe from. They want to know that you are going to get them results, but they also want to work with someone that they, they know. Um, so immerse yourself in those in environments. Okay, love it. Okay. Uh, what are some of the, well, I'll, I'll give you one and then I'll, I'll ask for a couple more examples. So one of the things that I noticed that was really interesting when I started hanging around really successful people in the business world, which would be the, the affluent, right? Um, I noticed that there's a couple of different currencies. So money obviously is a currency, but so is time freedom and mobility, right? And so as an agent, you're not, you're not, you can be at the same level income-wise as a middle management layer at a corporation, but you have way more freedom. You, you, could be, mm -hmm. you could be an executive level type person and not have as much freedom as you do as an agent. And so you have yep. these advantages. I remember one of my, one of my you know, clients has become a good friend of mine just mm -hmm. looking over at me one day and, and just blurting out, dude, you realize you're living one of my top five lives. Like, like of the, like of the lifestyles I would like to be living, you're living one of them. I'm like, wow, that's, that, that's amazing because I have complete control over my schedule, over my location yep. and all these other things. Like, so I'm able to cash in that freedom as a currency for other things. And I think affluence re responds not just to money, but also to the currency of time and mobility freedom. So it's something that we can keep in mind if we're not quite there in terms of being on their level of money affluence. They, they do respond to other, other forms of currency, if that makes sense. Well, and so here's the thing. I will tell you right now, as, as you know, and I'm sure you're, you're the same, as, as someone who um, I'm, I'm busy, I definitely have freedom because I've structured my business that way, but I'm, I'm, I'm a busy gal. You know, I travel, I speak all over the world. I've got a very full um, business, and – when I'm looking for service providers, I'm looking for people who are going to provide me with convenience. Hmm. And for you real estate agents, you know, I, I don't ever look at people and go, you know, for me to work with you, I want to make sure, uh, you know, like, let me see your bank statement. Mm -hmm. Right? I don't, people don't care about that. In fact, most affluent individuals, especially if they're in business, they want to give someone a heads up, like a hand up. Right, like they want to help people get to a higher place in business. They're looking for someone that has scrappy energy and they're willing to do whatever it takes. And they're also looking for people who are willing to provide that level of convenience. Meaning okay. that if, like, let me give you an example. When I bought one of my my properties in Vegas, my real estate agent came to me for the signing. They sent right. a mobile notary to my house for things. Okay. They sent a courier to come and pick things up and take them to the title company from me. Okay. Those are the kinds of things that I'm like, oh my gosh, this makes it so easy to do business with you. Love so it. how can you, in the, the service department, how can you be a stand above for your clients? Mm-hmm. That's really good. Yeah, and that's I think people um if they're not if they're not running a business at a certain level, um, they don't understand how much of a difference things like that make 
right? So we, we think of like a lot of agents think in terms of well, why, you know, even for themselves, they think of it this way, like, why wouldn't you drive to the office for the closing? Like, that's where the closing is. Well, nobody wrote that in stone. Most of the top agents in the country never go to their own closings. And the same is true, like for in your case, the closing could come to you. I mean, how many agents, uh, we've had a lot of guests on the show. I've literally never heard of anyone getting a mobile notary and taking the closing to a client, right? Yeah. And so that's, uh, which which really just, I think it just maybe takes it to poverty of imagination more than probably anything else. Um, but I don't think people realize without hanging around really successful wow. executives and entrepreneurs, just how focused they are on other things to the point where other ordinary life details become not like irrelevant slash inconvenient, right? Like yeah. laundry uh, or driving to an office to sign paper. Like that can literally, like that can knock out two or three hours of productivity, can throw off an entire day. Just having to drive to the office or somebody's office to sign something when you could have somebody show up to them. Let me give you, let me give you an, I'm going to give you um, a story that okay. I'm going to tell you guys a story and this will really give you a, deep insight into that thinking. Okay. So when I was about, let's say I'm 45 now, um, I must have been about 30 years old. And um, I had to go to an, a, an attorney's office. I was dealing with some estate stuff for my mom and I had to go to an attorney's office and I, I, my dad called me um, and he said, you know, hey, um, you know, Jim needs you to come pick up these documents. And I said, just have him FedEx it overnight. And he goes, you can't ask him to FedEx it overnight. He's like, that's going to cost like $30. And I said, I don't, I'll pay for it. I don't care. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll call his office and give him a credit card. And he goes, you're going to waste 30. So I remember he's an accountant, but he's still successful. But this is literally, I think I, what, this is my dad. And I literally think I taught him a lesson in this. Wow. Um, so, well, I would hope I did. <laughs> well, you know, who knows? <laughs> but I literally said to him, I'm like, so at the time, I was, I was billing about $300 an hour. And I said to him, you know, dad, it's going to cost about 30 bucks to FedEx it. I'm like, by the time that I, I get out of my yoga attire, I make myself presentable. I get in the car, I drive downtown, I park, I pay for parking. I have to go upstairs because he's a friendly friend. Now I'm going to have to freaking chit chat with him for a good 10 to 15 minutes. So I'm not rude. Right. Cause he was doing us a favor. Then I've got to get these documents. I got to drive home and then I got to get back into my off my office. I'm like, that is like, going to take me a good three hours. I'm like, that is $900 in billable time. It cost me 30 bucks to FedEx something. Yeah. FedEx it. <laughs> I'm like, in fact, I got to go. Like you just cost me yeah. like 50 bucks. I got to go. Yes. Explaining this. I'll you send just, you the bill. You, you, the just, you just cost me more than the damn FedEx would have cost. I got to go. Oh, I love it. Yeah, but mo most service providers, I run into this a lot with like dealing with other digital agencies that have like a different approach, right? So we we do like something very, very specific for our clients, right? We only handle one thing. We, we kick ass at that one thing. So we deal with a lot of clients that also work with like full service marketing agencies. And it's hilarious to deal with them because they constantly throw work back on the client. And I don't know if it's, I think some of it is just neglect and wanting to get stuff off their plate. And some of it might be a little passive aggressive, like they don't, you know, it's, it's kind of nice to throw something back on the client and say, hey, you need to do this to get me what I need, you know, do things. I, I see that a lot and I see it a lot with, with staff too. Like people, especially people that don't come from affluence, there's a little bit of that, they don't think anything of throwing something back on somebody that costs their time because they don't value their own time. They're not used to yes. thinking of it in terms of, I bill at $300 an hour, Therefore, anything that takes me an hour and I can do for less than 300, 300 bucks is worth that money. Like that's not how the yeah. average person thinks, but that is how an affluent person, if they've made their money in business, that is how they think. And yeah. you may not come to that naturally, but the more you. Love that. All right. Yeah. I think we froze up a little bit. Okay. So let's move on. So we talked about currency. 
We talked about a little bit about the misconceptions of affluent clients. What, what are some more? What are some, some interesting things that you've seen either on the relationship or the influencer side of marketing that agents can be thinking about and getting into? So on, on the marketing side, so, I mean, really, again, it is about, it is about building up those relationships. So networking is super, super, super important. Um, being, um, you know, I see a lot of real estate people like sponsoring stuff. I don't know how effective that is aside from brand awareness. Um, anytime that you're, you're speaking and you're able to add value, if you can find a speaking engagement where you are, where you are teaching, you know, where, where you, you're going to get in front of these people, maybe you're talking about marketing trends, maybe you're talking about, um, you know, maybe more investment type things. The speaking can be really good for real estate investments, but I will tell you the, I, I basically teach six six major key cornerstone strategies for marketing to millionaires and for real estate agents, especially that are going local um, and they're looking to get into an affluent market. The, the two major campaigns that I recommend are, Personal contact, which is there are people in your network that are already affluent, whether you know it or not. And in the program that I teach, we literally help you. Like people are like, I don't know that many people. And then they'll always call me back after they've done the exercise. And they're like, I have 1,500 names on my contact list. I'm like, yep. So personal contact. And the other one is that really deep like networking, both both personal networking and professional networking. So the other thing I was going to say is, you know, on this, what you like to do, join, if you like to drink wine, join a wine club. Um, like, I'm not talking about like where they just ship you the wine, although that's amazing too. Um, <laughs> but I'm talking about like, join like a wine tasters club or like, right. you know, some upper and I know in in the Silicon Valley there was a there was a wine club and every year they did like the purple foot awards you know I mean it was like this whole like old boys club of you know people that would get together and they would do these big wine pairing dinners um if you like to run do that you know if you like to golf it's worth the investment you guys it's worth the investment just immerse yourself into those environments because those are going to be the highest payoffs for real estate agents in the market. It's not going to be about you just blind online marketing. It is not going to be about, um, I love podcasts for real estate agents as well. Mm -hmm. um, that is a really good one when you do the strategy correctly, which you and I talked about. So I know you guys do the strategy correctly. Um, um, you know, things like that, where you're able to like put yourself in that influencer position are are really great. But if you're going to go with the tied and true mass marketing emails and, you know, um, aside from keeping in touch with people, mm -hmm. that's the only thing you're doing, right? Is like, if you can keep in touch with them. The other thing that I have, um, I did a really unique strategy for, for one of my clients I'm just, I'm thinking of, because it's not lunch, I'm going to have to say that and come back and tell you how, I'll tell you, I'll tell you about it offline. I did an extremely okay, cool. unique strategy for yeah. one of my clients that is working really, really, really well. Um, and it had to do with influencer marketing and not even marketing yourself as a real estate agent. Stop going to rubber chicken lunches. Stop, stop throwing your card at people. No one gives a shit. Like that is not how, that's not how you're going to get those affluent clients. <laughs> Right. The, they, they want to know you. Yeah. Well, let, let's uh, I want to bounce around a couple of ideas and throw some things at you. Um, before we do that, everybody that's watching live with us, um, throw me out um, a club, a club that's in your area that would attract affluent clients. And let's let's bounce around some ideas in the in the comments section here of, um, uh, like you said, golf, wine, uh, nonprofits and and clubs. Let's throw out some ideas mm -hmm. uh, here in the comments that other people can learn from and think about in their area. All right. And so if you're not ready to clubs. join the country club, service clubs. Yeah, service clubs, you guys. And then um, I very briefly, for about four seconds, joined. Um, oh gosh, what is it called? There's a women's club that supports education. The junior league. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. 
I literally think I had PTSD from that. No offense, Junior League, but <laughs> I, I literally, like, it was like four minutes, and I'm like, I can't with you bitches. I'm sorry. Like, no. I love what they're up to, but the caddy, uh-huh. no, it was, it was just, I think it was the chapter. Just the, yeah, exactly. Just, just the wrong. The chapter. Just, just but the great wrong organization. You yeah, should, you should check, you should check it out. <laughs> That's, Junior League is amazing. <laughs> okay, um, so I'll throw out some stuff on influencer marketing because what, one, of the, one of the things that I've noticed is uh, when you're developing relationships with people that are ultra successful, uh, yes, they want to see the scrappiness. Yes, they want to see the willingness to make, make it convenient for them. Uh, it definitely helps, though, as you, as you grow as a person and, and as you grow in business. You mentioned speaking, right? So and speaking and podcasting, things like that, maybe writing a book or talking. Like I've noticed that just um, me being a reader and being interested, like in my case, obsessed, but, you know, somebody else could be just interested in personal development and business development. Mm-hmm. And just reading is to be able to talk about the common interests, the things that they have in common, and be able to go deep on that with them is absolutely huge. So personal development, business development material, things like that. But then the more you, the more successful you get, the more, the better you get at sharing those things. Like you said, you're going to get asked to speak. And can you add value? And not just in terms of like talking about what the market's doing, because most of the time people don't care. But they will care if you're able to add value in other ways. So I don't know if you have any any examples, but I can tell you, like our my my co-host that's usually here, Greg McDaniel. Besides this podcast, he's also on the radio in the Bay Area, which goes out to like you know, hun- like hundreds of square miles. I think it's a really good signal. Um, so when he runs into somebody that's living in a one, two, three, you know, three million dollar home, no big deal. Like that's the home he grew up in. Right. He's on the radio every Sunday in talking right. about Silicon Valley and talking about East Bay real estate like that. Right. That's just it's the water he swims in like it's no big deal. Um, and I think the more that we can get to be like that, like he has his own credibility going in. Once they find out that he is somebody, it, it, it's not it's not that they necessarily look up to him. It's that, oh, you, we're in the same club. Yeah. You know, so one of the things that. So I'm I'm going to I'm going to hint to what I'm doing with this other this other person. So okay. like let's just let's just use the, the the podcasting as an example. How could you utilize a podcast to reach your ideal clients in your affluent area on something that is outside of real estate? Okay. Right? How could you bring a community together in something that is outside of real estate that has a huge amount of traction in your local area? So like you know, um, uh, you know. L- let me give you, l- let me give you an example. And you guys might think, like, what the heck does this have to do with real estate? And I'll tie it back in. So, in where I grew up, I grew up in Los Gatos, California, um, which is in the South Bay area. Very, very affluent town. Um, my my house right before I moved here, I was on the same block as the CEO of Netflix and um, the 49er coach and whatever. Um, super, super nice area, but Los Gatos is super dog friendly. Like they have so much stuff that is around dogs. So like taking the example of like a Facebook live or taking the example of podcasting, or if there's something that is really unique toward what your town is, where you're going to be marketing is up to. How could you create an influence where you're bringing something together to create a community amongst your community and you lead that community? Mm -hmm. Those affluent people. At that point, you've now put yourself into the leadership position. You're now creating influence. You're gaining that recognition amongst people. You're building that know, like, and trust, and you're doing it outside of your business. And then at that point, you know, because they like you, they're going to start to want to get to know you. And the, what's the first question people are going to ask you? Oh, what, what do, do you do? do for a living? Great. Yeah. yeah. Like I actually, I rep, I rep houses. And if you know when anyone's selling their house, like I'd be happy to take care of them. When you come in that way, that is the golden ticket for affluent marketing. Gotcha. Yep. 
to come in outside of the context of business, to come in through a personal connection and, and a personal commonality, right, a common yes. interest. Okay. Yes. Gotcha. Key it's core. interesting I've because I don't think so that's many- – yeah, I, I don't think that just applies to the affluent. I think you're. I think it's. You, you mentioned that it's. It's more that they. They like take that to the hilt. I think that's most people. It's how most people would like to meet their agent. It's just that most agents are really bad at marketing that way if they market at all. Right. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Like I think most people would like to meet their agent through a personal connection or a commonality, but the affluent makes it more worth it. It's a big enough carrot on the end of the stick to get agents to in, do it more intentionally. And the thing with this strategy is you have to do it into a topic that that is going to attract those affluent clientele. Right. In your area. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a lot of people on the coast that listen. So Florida, California, you know, stuff like that. Um, waterfront property, amazing. Right. So anything like that that's going to attract, you know, a, a crowd of yachting, sailing, you know, that type of crowd and the people that want to live on the water because they like to yacht and sail. I mean, you know, golf communities, lake communities, that type of thing. Like anything that's based around that is going to have a much higher probability of putting you in touch with affluent clients. I think yep. we lose touch with that a lot. Just the, the fact join that we can specialize. Club. If you are out there, join a yacht mm-hmm. club. Yeah. Love it. And we didn't even get in the conversation really of how to differentiate yourself so that when you do have that conversation of what do you do, that you have something Mm -hmm. compelling and interesting to say that separates them from the other people that might be trying to do the same thing. Or Aunt Betty, who's 20 or 30 years older than you, who's been in the Yacht Club for 30 years, right? So uh, that's what I want people – we don't have time to get into it on the show, but it's something that you do work with uh, in in, in your client work. So what's the best way for people to learn about you and, and get into your world? Sure. So you can actually check me out. I'm um, I'm all online too. So you you can find me. You can follow me on 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 Facebook or Twitter uh, at Kelly O'Neill. Also, if you go to my site www.kellyoneill.com, I'm sure you guys will drop a little link in below. Um, you can actually take a quiz. One of the things that I work with in working strategically with clients is I want to understand what I call their profitpreneur profile type. And that is that we've identified nine, nine different archetypes of the way that, that entrepreneurs work um, and learn and strategize best in the way that they operate their business to create and accelerate their path to profit. So hmm. go on my site, and it's absolutely free. You can jump on there and take the free quiz. Um, and then, you know, ping me on Facebook. Let me know what your profitpreneur type is. Um, you can start there. I also offer a um, complimentary profit analysis session. If you go on my website and click under um, consulting, drop to the bottom, request a complimentary session, and I would be happy um, to chat with you about your specific business and your specific needs if if I am someone who resonates with you. Oh, love it, love it, love it. Okay. And then everybody, we will drop a link to that in the show notes. And then for everybody that uh, that is watching, make sure to go and subscribe uh, to the show. You can go to either iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, whichever the case is, depending on your device. And we'd love you for, uh, to leave a rating and a review. And specifically, if there was a guest that you enjoyed, like if you enjoyed Kelly's episode, give Kelly like a public shout out in the review uh, to thank her for the time and the contribution. Um, and Kelly, I hope people get like connected with you and get into your world because, like I said, we we encourage everybody that kind of goes through our world. Uh, to get into kind of that 36 to life mentality. Um, I work with a ton of real estate teams um, and a ton of people that are doing 500,000, you know, 2,000 deals a, a year. That's not everybody, right? That is a small sliver of people who want to and are equipped to do that. Most agents would rather have like a lifestyle business. Uh, and this stuff is is perfect for that because the personal networking, the influencer marketing and things like that, it may not generate a thousand deals a year, but it doesn't have to. Uh, and if you're working with people that own multi-million dollar homes, you actually don't need that many deals to have a great lifestyle and support in a whole family on one income if you want to do that. And so I know that there's a lot of people in the audience that would like to go that direction. Uh, and so I want them to kind of get into your world and get familiar with these with these concepts. So that being said, Kelly, I appreciate the time. Thank you so much for uh, for being here. Thank you for having me.